Hi, welcome again to the show. I'm Leslie Choice, and my guest today is American writer Eric Larson. He's the author of The Devil in the White City and his more recent book, Thunderstruck. Good to have you here in Halifax. Thanks. It's great to be back here. Now, this novel, Thunderstruck, if someone wasn't careful and they just kind of dipped right into it without reading the cover carefully, they might think it was a novel. Right, right. Fictional. Was that intentional? Uh, but it, what I try to do is what some people like to refer to as narrative history. Um, and my goal is to I mean, I stick very, very closely to the facts. These are histories, believe me. But what I try to do is I try to apply um, novelistic techniques within the books. For example, using suspense. And, and, and it's not really sort of manipulating anything. What all I'm trying to do is break the story back into its component parts so that, so that you, as the reader, experience the story as those who lived it experienced it without knowing the end yet. Right, and, and it, it works really well. Now, you say that you hope the book will create a kind of historical trance. What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, my, goal is not, uh, my goal is not to inform. Um, I, I may, maybe that sounds odd coming from a former journalist and uh, a, a nonfiction writer, but my goal is that a reader will pick up one of my books, begin reading, sink into the time and place and the action, and not emerge from the book until it's finished. More, more how people approach fiction. Um, and then emerge from that book feeling as though the reader, he or she, has lived um, or experienced that past and maybe, maybe emerges a little bit changed by the perception of, of that past time. Okay, take us back to this particular era then. This is the Edwardian era. Um, what would life have been like for um, a well-to-do English gentleman? Well, um, yeah, this was, this was um, the, the, the time period that's covered in the book is actually the, the late Victorian, the last decade of the Victorian era, you know, the 90s to, to, uh, uh, to uh, 1900, 1901, um, and then the, uh, the, what is typically referred to as the Edwardian era, 1900 through 1910. Um, and uh, um, a, a well-to-do um, upper-class English gentleman would have a very nice life um, in London in this era. Um, it was a time um, when there was a good deal of ambient luxury for that class. Um, houses were enormous and well decorated, and restaurants were quite quite lush and lavish. And there were clubs. There were many many private clubs that uh, the uh, the typical British gentleman could could uh, could retreat to. And and they were very much the way one they're often um, portrayed in, in in movies. You know, these sort of quiet, somewhat stuffy, I would argue, places where you could smoke endless cigars and talk about your exploits and so forth. And it was an intellectual time, too. There was a curiosity, and um, science had this uh, mass appeal, didn't it? What kind of things were people interested in? Yeah, it was very, very much a time um, when, uh, when the, the intellect was allowed to, allowed to, to flare, uh, if you will. Um, science was possibly the most compelling subject. Um, scientific advances were, were occurring seemingly everywhere. It was also, though, one of the things that I think is very important about science in that period that made it so compelling is that it was also very accessible. That is to say, you know, in contrast to now where things are sort of in the, the nanosphere, you know, microscopic, you can't even begin to perceive or even think about how, how these things are done. Um, in the era that I, I write about, um, you know, you had ocean liners that were trying to cross the Atlantic at the fastest speed possible. This was what constituted, you know, the ultimate in physics and, and science and engineering. And, you know, what could be possibly more accessible, more easy to picture than a massive ship, you know, racing across the Atlantic? So, so things were accessible. It was easy to sort of incite the imagination. Um, and, and into that, of course, into that, that, that context came, um, things were starting to emerge that were a little bit less easy to understand. Like, All those uh, invisible, yeah, yeah, invisible forces. Yeah. New worlds. And, and this kind of fit into the, an interesting context because 
Of course, Charles Darwin had already shaken things up in an amazing way. He had, he had. I mean, it, it, it's really hard to appreciate now, but but he really caused this this kind of mass uh, convulsion of introspection. People deciding, um, on the one hand, well, I guess that means there really is no God, there is no religion, and others being driven then um, even deeper into sort of a kind of peculiar, more peculiar spiritual pursuit, hunting the afterlife, needing to find proof to refute Darwin. So it was this kind of interesting dichotomy. It, it seems almost the mix of science and sorcery uh, that, that's going on there, and people don't uh, distinguish between the two. What, what kind of the, um, you know, the afterlife side of things? Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. How were people trying to communicate with the dead, for example? That was one of the most interesting things to me, one of the most surprising. Um, um, when I began doing my, my research into, uh, into the, the whole London side of the story, one of the things that I discovered early on was that in the 1890s, um, London, um, British society, especially upper crust British society, there was prevalent belief in the afterlife, in in ghosts, in um, being able to communicate with the dead. In fact, one of the one popular pursuit at um, high society dinner parties was afterwards to uh, to have a medium come in and hold a séance, um, complete with table wrappings and and ectoplasmic uh, appearances and so forth, and people. People really believed that these things were happening. In fact, um, William, William Crookes, one of the leading physicists of the age, um, wrote uh, very matter-of-factly about uh, one particular medium and his ability to levitate himself and, and pass out one window of a, of a, of a second-story um, room and come back in through the other. And, and, and he wrote about it with the absolute conviction that this had actually happened. Yeah. Now, that's interesting. In a way, it ties in with um, Mr. Marconi and these invisible radio waves, they're, they're all sort of operating in the same plane of existence. Maybe um, introduce us to him, and then we're going to get a little closer to the heart of the story. Yeah, um, first of all, Marconi was, uh, um, uh, he was Italian born, but um, really he was more English than Italian, or, or more, uh, more uh, how should we say, British Empire than Italian. His mother was, was uh, a daughter of the Irish uh, whiskey uh, um, uh, clan, the Jamesons. Um, Marconi spoke better English, actually, than Italian, at least initially in his early days. He was mocked for his Italian accent by his Italian school friends and was often referred to as the little Englishman. So it was not, not an unnatural thing that he would come to Britain to try to, try to um, introduce his, his invention to the world. Now, w one of the things we have to do, though, when you, when you talk about Marconi introducing this thing, is you have to go back to the time before radio, to the time before wireless, and try, make yourself imagine what that was like. It's very hard today, because we all have cell phones, we have wireless computers, we have radio blaring at us all the time from our cars. Um, but it's very important to go back to that period and, and think to you, try, try to force yourself to think about what that was like before that existed. The only means of communication then were, were, were physical, visible media, wires, wires both telephone and telegraph, um, optical, um, optical sending systems, heliographs, where you could actually signal with light, um, carrier pigeons to some extent, the military used, used those. Um, but um, along comes Marconi and, and is sending messages through what people, of course, referred to then as the ether, through invisible space and causing something to happen at a remote distance. Not just 10 feet away, 20 feet away, but in other rooms, outside a building, um, and ultimately his, his real early breakthrough over a hilltop, which proved for the first time that, that you could actually harness electromagnetic radiation, these waves, and make them, make them, make them go over the horizon, which is, was a real revelation that Marconi took to heart. Now, he must have had his detractors. He had many detractors. Um, uh, part of the problem was that um, he was Italian. I mean, again, he was more English than Italian, but to the British, he was perceived as being Italian and a foreigner. And it's one thing, it was one thing in that era, in terms of British established science, to be a um, to be from, say, Germany, where science was revered. The British respected German scientists. It's another thing entirely to be Italian and come to Britain claiming to have developed this new technology. So he was suspect from the beginning. 
But it was also the character of wireless that, that, that contributed to the skepticism about Marconi because it was such an amazing thing, such an unbelievable thing. Um, and it had a lot in common with something else that was very common at the time in, um, in, in London um, and in Britain, which was this, this, this love of, of magic shows. Magic was, was, was a, a very sort of powerful force in 1890s London. And so you had this guy, this foreigner, um, with almost no formal education. That was another aspect, almost no formal education. His mother was very indulgent. She didn't want him raised by priests, by the, the Jesuits and so forth in, in Italy. And she indulged him in his sort of his, 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 um, his obsession with electricity and so forth, so that he really had a very impressionistic education. So you have this guy who's Italian, he's foreign, he has no education, at least not in terms of the, the British perception, and he's coming to London to demonstrate this thing that, you know, it, looking at it objectively, had to be a magic trick. It shouldn't work, but it, it works. It shouldn't work. Right. Um, and so that's what sort of laid the, the groundwork for this, this skepticism that actually dogged him throughout the early part of his career. Now, why was the wireless so important to uh, seagoing ships at the time? Well, and that's one of the things we have to take ourselves back to um, in terms of thinking about uh, what the world was like before wireless. Um, if you can imagine before wireless setting sail on a ship for a transatlantic voyage, um, you know, hair raising enough as it is with storms, with you know, problems with, with ship design and so forth, and lack of weather forecasting uh, at, in, at mid ocean and, and whatnot. But add to that the fact that once you set sail um, without wireless, um, once you were over the horizon, there was absolutely no means of communicating with you. And there was no means by which you could communicate with anybody on shore. Um, ships routinely disappeared with absolutely no trace, no one knowing at all what happened to those ships because there was simply no means of communicating. Yes. So the revolution, and ship owners were the first to really begin to see that wireless was, could in fact be a truly practical technology. The rest of the world kind of took a while to catch up. It was still seemed to be sort of a novelty. But, but ship owners recognized that at last they would be able to use this, this, that this technology at last ended the silence of, of the seas. And Marconi saw that also. Um, he realized that um, um, quite early on, that, that it, you know, at, at th this technology had the power to remove that isolation of captains once they, once they set sail. Now, just as a, a side note, uh, Marconi left his footprint here in Nova Scotia. What was his relationship? Very important one here. Yeah, Nova Scotia um, was critical to his, to his journey. Um, one of the things that, and, and again, the skepticism comes into play here. Um, there, was, there was so much skepticism about him um, and, and so much skepticism about wireless ever becoming a practical technology. Um, but at the same time, there were also a lot of people who began to see that maybe Marconi was on to something. So there was a fair amount of competition that was beginning to rise, um, particularly in the, in the United States. And Marconi recognized that he really had to, in order to maintain his, his dominance of wireless, he really had to do something spectacular. And once again, without, without really knowing in any way whether it was really possible to do, and in fact, established physics would have said it was absolutely impossible. Um, Marconi set out to send a signal across the Atlantic Ocean. He wanted to send a wireless signal to prove, to prove A, that wireless could go extremely long distances, but most important, that it really could, it really could um, defeat the curvature of the Earth, if you will. Um, standing, um, standing physical physics thinking said that, that, that that wireless waves were like were optical in character, so that if you sent if you sent a message, it would continue in a straight line off the planet into outer space. His his first messages were received actually um, through very crude mechanism in Newfoundland. So um, Marconi was invited then um, uh, to to come to to uh, to come to Canada, um, come to um, come to Nova Scotia. He was given all kinds of help, set up a station at, uh, at Glace Bay, and uh, began working um, on trying to make this kind of transatlantic communication a much more um, predictable and reliable phenomenon. And that's why, that's why Nova Scotia is critical to the whole story. Okay, and uh, we're going to leave Mr. Marconi th right there, and we're going to come back to your novel, Thunderstruck, and we'll take a short break, and I'll see you in a minute. <laughs>
This program is presented as a public service by Mount St. Vincent University. Hi, welcome back. My guest today is Eric Larson. We're talking about his novel, Thunderstruck. We've been talking about Marconi and that wireless invention, but of course the, the story also follows Dr. Hawley Harvey Crippen, who seems like a nice enough guy from the yeah. outset. Tell us about him. Now, Cripp, Crippen, first of all, first, first of all, he was an American, um, and he was an American physician who um, came to apply his, his skills to uh, the creation of patent medicines, which was a very popular thing to do back in the 1890s, early, early 1900s. Popular because it was a very lucrative thing to do as well, and he was particularly good at it. Um, so good that the company he worked for, Money and Home Remedies, uh, decided to have him run their London office, and so he went there with, uh, with, uh, with his, his wife, Belle. Um, Crippen, um, Crippen is not a name that is terribly well known in North America. It is very well known in Britain. In fact, I would, I would argue that he is the second most famous killer in British history after, of course, Jack the Ripper. Um, he went to London um, with his, ultimately his wife, his wife joined him. Fairly unhappy marriage, I guess. At this point, their marriage was in, was in fairly spectacular decay, yeah. Um, she, they had married, um, uh, she, I, I believe, saw him kind of as her ticket to, uh, to achieve an ambition of hers, which was to become one of the world's great opera singers. That was when they were still in America, and when she still thought she had talent, which uh, people rapidly assured her she did not. But he paid for her, her music lessons. Um, by the time she got to London, she was very frustrated. The opera thing was not working out. She decided to apply her skills to uh, the British equivalent of vaudeville, which was called variety. She failed there as well. And in concert with that, um, the intensity of the decline of this marriage increased. Um, she became really pretty much, um, pretty much a shrew, kind of a harpy. Well, although at the same time, she was really much loved by, by her friends in, in, in the theater. And he takes some rather dramatic means to end the marriage. Yes, yes. I mean, Crippen, Crippen meanwhile, is this, is this unassuming little character. Even after the cataclysmic events in the book, even, even after that, um, his wife's best friends described him as the kindest of men. I mean, and he looked, he, he, he was a completely innocuous looking character. If you saw him on the street, he would be, you wouldn't see him. He would be utterly invisible. And yet, he kills his wife. He kills his wife. And what I, there's portions of this book that I don't particularly want to give away, but what he does is fairly spectacular after that, as, as Scotland Yard eventually discovers. Okay, now the viewers are probably wondering, what does wireless communication have to do with Dr. Crippen and his murder? As was I when, when in the course of just sort of vaguely sort of thinking about wireless as a subject for a book, I came across the name Crippen in a, in a quite excellent online database. What happened is um, that um, wireless, Marconi's wireless, is what orchestrated this very interesting, um, very interesting criminal chase, and, and I think arguably this is the single greatest criminal chase in, in, in history. It certainly eclipses the O.J. Simpson thing in, in America. Um, and um, what happened is that, is that Crippen and, of course, his, his lover, the age-old story, he fell in love with his secretary. This is before the, the murder. The murder sort of helps things along. Um, he uh, and his lover um, escape Britain um, and in Antwerp board a ship called the SS Montrose. Um, it is a ship that is equipped with the latest in wireless technology and also has a captain aboard who is a really kind of turns out to be a, a, a natural detective. And he's, he's known about the murder. It's, there's already a global manhunt underway. He knows some details about who, who these people are. He knows Crippen is on board. He, he doesn't know it yet, but he begins to suspect that Crippen might be on board because he's disguised and, and, and his, his lover, Ethel, is disguised as a boy. Um, and they're traveling as father and son. But he realizes that, that there's a good chance that they are, in fact, the fugitives in, in this murder case. And so um, he sends one of the, I think, one of the great wireless messages of, of, of radio history um, in which he notifies um, Scotland Yard of the presence, the likely presence of the fugitives aboard his ship. 
Scotland Yard Inspector Walter Dew, veteran of the Jack the Ripper uh, uh, investigations, has now been on the force for a long time. He gets the idea, I will set off in pursuit in a faster ocean liner and intercept them in the St. Lawrence um, at a point called, uh, called Father Point. That's where pilots boarded the inbound bound ships near, a town of, near the town of Ramuski. Okay, and we're going to leave the story there for just a minute because we're going to take a short break and we'll come back to the chase for the criminal right after this. If you'd like more information about this or any of the programs we produce at Mount St. Vincent University, call us or email. We welcome your comments. My guest today is Eric Larson, and we're uh, chasing a murderer across the Atlantic with wireless communication just recently invented. Uh, the chief inspector, Walter Drew. Do, do. Do, does he get his man? I'm not gonna say. Not gonna but, 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 but what is compelling about the chase, though, I mean, this, this is the thing that drew me to the, to the story. The thing that just absolutely captivated me was that there was this chase across the Atlantic between two ocean liners. Which, which first was sort of the, the emblematic technology of the age was the ocean liner, and here was this sort of interesting new technology, wireless, sort of starting to nudge into the, into the, the spotlight. But what was so wonderful about it is that, that Captain Kendall began sending messages describing the behavior of these fugitives aboard his ship, and the world just lapped it up. I mean, this was a chase that, in, in terms of the era, was, was followed in real time, or at least as real time as, as newspapers and telegraph and wireless allowed. So the world knew this was going on. Crippen himself, who's the subject for the chase, does not. No, exactly. Nobody, nobody aboard ship except the captain and a couple of his officers knew that, that, that these likely were, were the suspects. So what you, the situation you had then was you had literally the world, millions upon millions of readers around the world, aware of the minutest details of, of, of the, 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 the suspect's behavior aboard ship, you know, table manners, books they were reading and so forth, and they had absolutely no clue that they were being first watched and be, being pursued by the Scotland Yard inspector. So does this ultimately help promote wireless communication? In very a much way? so, very much so. The episode has been somewhat lost um, to, to, to historical um, appreciation because of what happened a couple of years afterwards, and that was, of course, the sinking of the Titanic, in which wireless played a very, very important role. Um, but this was the moment that, that really put wireless on center stage throughout the world and really helped nudge it from, eliminate those last, that last surviving reservoir of skepticism that it could actually become something other than a novelty. And that's what, yeah, that was the role of this case. Now you must have a real passion for this kind of research. I love it. I love it. I mean, that people often ask me, well, what do you prefer, the writing or the research? And I have to say that I'm, I'm, I, I love them both. I mean, my, my gr case in point in, the, in Thunderstruck, I, mean, I, love, I love finding little details that are just somehow, somehow charming and telling. Um, and without giving too much away, I mean, one of the little details, a little itty bitty detail, but nonetheless, it's something that, the kind of thing that I love to find is that when Scott and Yard was interviewing neighbor, neighbors um, after the, the quite horrifying discovery by, by Inspector Dew, um, one of the witnesses that they interviewed was a woman um, who was named May Pohl. Now, it's a minor thing. It's a small little thing. But just the fact that somebody interviewed by Scott and Yard was named Miss May Pohl, I found absolutely charming. And the fact also that, that you know, Scotland Yard, when they, uh, I talk a little bit about Scotland Yard and their origin, not origins, but their, their evolution. When they moved from their old offices um, to, their, to their new offices, which of course were called, caused them to be called New Scotland Yard, um, they left behind their, their lost and found department. Um, they left it behind deliberately, it's not like they forgot it, but they left behind their lost and found department. And in this lost and found department, there were 14,212 umbrellas. I love those facts. Wow. I the love the fact umbrellas. that yeah. even the British in the Edwardian era were losing their umbrellas. Yeah. yeah. Eric Larson, thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your novel with us today. Pleasure. Thanks. And thanks for watching the show. My name is Leslie Choice, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>